Welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to have with me Dr. Lynn Patrick. She's a doctor of naturopathic medicine and a pioneer in environmental medicine. She's published in peer-reviewed medical journals. She's authored a chapter in the textbook, Clinical Environmental Medicine, in 2019. She certifies doctors in their training of environmental medicine. This is very important because this is technical. It is a specialty area, just like we think about oncology and rheumatology, any area where you need to go to a specialist, we need to consider environmental, environmental medicine in this category. So I'm just so grateful that Dr. Patrick is doing this for doctors. And she's just done so much for us in environmental medicine and continues to do so. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dr. Parpia. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm very excited to be here. As you know, this is my favorite topic to talk about. Yeah. Uh, I think that we, uh, those of us who work in the field of environmental medicine are both encouraged and also a little bit wary about how the word detox has made its way into the kind of common lexicon of everyone, right? The word detox is recognized as a familiar term. Um, but as you just alluded to, it really is a very extremely technical process in the body and has to be addressed by someone who actually knows about those technicalities. You know, you've been trained in that area. Um, I've been teaching in that area for, um, it's been about the last 23 years and I also am faculty for the Metabolic Medicine Institute, which is a training group that works in conjunction with George uh, Washington Medical School to actually give uh, physicians who are in practice, naturopathic physicians, MDs, advanced practice nurses, a training in uh, both the relationship of environmental toxic and exposure to disease, how to diagnose these problems, and how to treat and manage them. So it is, uh, you know, probably at least a year's worth of study. And in the training program that I run, which is uh, EMEI, it stands for Environmental Med Medicine Education International, we actually take doctors and put them through a year-long training program. Uh, they have many hours of didactic lectures they have to listen to, and then we meet every month for a grand rounds where we discuss patient cases and how to manage those very, very difficult patients. The reality of what we're dealing with today is we have a significant toxicant load. Anyone who was born before 1990 has a body burden of lead just because of when they were born, right? Um, right. In addition to all the other chemicals that are in our environment. <clears throat> and we have this I'm going to say tsunami, we can use other words, of both mold exposure and mycotoxin exposure as a result of residential and, uh, and commercial building problems that we have with our building industry uh, that allow for mold growth. And then we have Lyme disease, which is an ever-increasing epidemic as a result of global warming. You know, I live in Colorado. And uh, we've never had ticks until two years ago. We now have a tick problem. We now have Lyme disease in Colorado. Right. And, yeah. Even at high elevations, you know, 9,000, 10,000 feet up in the air, it's warm enough now to have ticks. And so we have a whole kind of uh, re a, a new problem that we're having to deal with. So this combination of toxic and exposure and chronic infection makes practicing environmental medicine even more challenging. So thus, even greater need for that specialty education. But getting to today's topic, which is detox, what is it, <laughs> right? right. Um, I, I want to start out with just a little, um, a little bit of my perspective on this. You know, we know that the actual acknowledgement of environmental toxicants causing disease has been in medicine since the 40s and the 50s. We have pioneers in this area who were MDs, medical doctors, Herbert Rinkle, um, 
Theodore uh, Randolph, Dr. Randolph, who actually were some of the first doctors to realize that pesticides were hurting people. Remember DDT, we've had that, you know, that was available back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and wasn't even taken out of commerce until 1972. So we have a long history of that toxicant and, and a lot of exposure. However, <clears throat> due to some uh, uh, pressure by the, the chemical companies, these doctors were basically not listened to and their assertion that toxicants cause disease was really downplayed. And even our very own kind of modern father of environmental medicine, Dr. William Ray, who was a cardiothoracic surgeon, as well as running a hospital for environmental illness or patients who had been environmentally poisoned, he was also, uh, he had a difficult time getting the attention of the medical profession. Uh, certainly because I think we've had this longstanding, uh, and I want to say an actual overt and conscious uh, kind of pressure from the chemical industry to downplay this relationship, right? So uh, for those of us that now are paying attention, even though this downplaying of the importance of our exposure to toxicants on a daily basis is still happening from, I'm sad to say, you know, even the, the, the more um, astute and, and educated aspects of the conventional medical profession. I think there's so much information out there about our exposure levels that the general public is very clear that there is a constant and continuous exposure that we all have to chemicals every day and that those chemicals alter our immune systems, our reproductive systems, our nervous systems, our endocrine systems, and our, um, well, <laughs> basically every system of the body. You know, there's no system that gets away without being affected. Right, and so the patients that I focus on have complex chronic illness. They come to us with longstanding Lyme disease or tick-borne disease, mold, mycotoxin illness, and then those wastebasket terms, right? Chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, where the doctors don't know why they have to put this label on the patient. Autoimmune conditions, for example. Depression and that does not respond to standard treatment. Exactly. That, yeah nervous system dysregulation, mast cell activation syndrome. Most of my patients have all of this all at once. And of course, I'm testing their toxins, their environmental toxicant loads. I'm looking for metals. I'm looking for pesticides, insecticides, glyphosate, and I'm looking for their infections. And of course, I'm seeing high environmental toxicant loads in this patient population. and once I begin to detoxify them in a way that's personalized for the patients, I can see that they're actually able to handle treatment of the infections, or sometimes even their infections start to go away. If I detox, if I detox them first, now that's, that's immune regulation right there just by detox. Tell us about the, the research on environmental toxins and, and their their contribution to immune dysregulation and complex chronic illness. All right, well, where I would love to start, it looks like you need to enable participant screen sharing for me, Dr. Parpia, okay. just so I can share my screen. Where I would like to start, start is by telling everyone out there that the federal government, your tax dollars, funds the Center for Disease Control, <clears throat> which has a huge database of toxicant exposure in the general population. So you actually have access to this. It's available to everyone. You can look it up. Let me uh, share my screen with everybody. And I'm gonna take you to what is called the National Report on Human Exposure to Environmental Chemicals. Now this has been ongoing for two decades. It's a huge amount of people every two years. They actually have uh, huge buses that go out all over the country and collect urine 
and blood from people like you and me. Large groups of people, 5,000 people, 7,000 people. And then they look in the blood and urine of those people for over 200 chemicals. And it's in this database right here. So if we uh, go to this page, which is cdc.gov exposure report, it's the index for the exposure report. And we go to the actual data tables, which are in this beautiful little searchable database right here. And we look for, oh, let's say lead. That's a good one. And we wanna look for blood lead from the year 2011 to the year 2018. So those are the years in which data was actually collected from, as you can see, sample sizes as large as 8,000 people. Um, and that was for the years uh, 2011, 2012. We have actual information about blood lead on these individuals, right? So here's the important thing. Uh, we know from uh, epidemiologic studies that have looked at this database uh, for 19 years. So there's actually a recent study that was published in Lancet Public Health by Dr. Bruce Lamphier, who is a career uh, public health epidemiologist. He specialized in, blood, in uh, lead poisoning in children. We know that levels as high as 2.3, 2.6, I'm gonna say 2.6, increase risk for dying of a heart attack or dying of a stroke, significantly. Dying of a stroke, more than twice the risk. So just having a blood lead level over 2.6. Now, what I'm gonna show you here is that there's a significant amount of the population that has a blood level over 2.6. And they are here in this group and you can see that, right? You can see 3.16 back in 2011 up to 2.4, but you know, 2.4 is the average and it goes all the way up to 2.6. The 95th percentile just means the top 5% of the population. Now, when you go in to get your blood drawn and you say, hey, I was born after 1990 and I just saw this webinar where this doctor talked about, and this, this is, you know, I have people um, <laughs> in academic centers that, that have agreed with me on this, that anyone born after or before 1990 has a significant body burden of lead that increases their risk from dying of cardiovascular disease. And I want my blood lead level drawn, please. Um, it is a test you have access to. Every lab in the world does it, and it will cost about $50 out of pocket if your insurance doesn't cover it. Your physician may say, I have no idea why you want that. I've never read that study. And that's because most doctors don't read these studies. They have no time to read the medical literature. And, you know, toxicology, environmental toxicology, uh, toxic uh, metal uh, research is not their thing. But it is true that uh, everyone around the globe has a body lead burden historically because we put lead in paint and we put lead in gasoline. <clears throat> and when gasoline was combusted or paint chips became dust, uh, that created an, a global burden of lead. So it's in the atmosphere and it's in the soil um, and it is in old buildings that were built before 1982. So, this is a, a government database that has over 200 chemicals in it. So if you're exposed to a chemical, you can get a pretty good idea of what the average American level is in terms of blood and urine. So not hair and uh, not stool and not tissue. The CDC doesn't measure those, but they definitely measure blood and urine. So this is an open access database. I don't have any secret passwords. Everyone has access to this. Every physician has access to this. They just don't know how to use it and they don't know how to interpret the data in it. And that's what we teach our doctors to do so that when they do have patients that they suspect, for example, I'll give you a great, um, a great example of a patient, uh, a woman who, had uh, an old home. She has uh, several, ch four children, ages two to 15. She had painters come 
to paint her home because the paint was chipping and they really needed to repaint the entire outside of the home. According to the law, when you have an old home and you're going to repaint it, you have to bag that home. So you literally put a plastic bag around it so that all of the dust from the paint that you're sanding off gets captured because that dust could have lethal levels of lead in it, right? So uh, the company was not up to snuff in terms of following the law and they did not bag the house. Uh, so there was a lot of dust that was breathed in by she and her entire family during that week when the entire house was a big two-story house was sanded and uh, her blood pressure went up significantly and uh, one of her children became very sick. Um, he got headaches, he was lethargic, he got stomach aches. And because she was paying attention, um, took her entire brood into the physician and, and kind of forced them to do blood lead testing. And her lead level <clears throat> was 45. Standard lead level is between 0.5 and you know, 1.5, that's the average here. You can see the geometric mean for 2017, 2018 is um, 0.7. So this was, you know, many, many, many times above the average. Uh, so both she and her children had to actually be treated for lead toxicity. This is not an uncommon occurrence. No, I see <clears throat> my patient population. In fact, there's, I've had many patients come to me they're in a state of chronic Lyme all of a sudden, but likely is that they had the tick bite a long time ago, but their immune system was able to keep that Lyme in check as the immune system should be able to do that. But they lived in the house when it was being renovated or they, they, they moved back in three days later, test their blood blood, it's high and do some tests to look at chronic Lyme. I'm looking at T cell tests, not just antibody tests. And sure enough, they are, they're, they're fighting Lyme right now and they have a high blood lead, but they weren't fighting Lyme prior to moving back into the house. You know, this is a, it's really great that you bring this up, Dr. Parpia, because uh, we think of lead in kind of toxicologic terms, right? It, it uh, has the capacity for uh, causing cardiovascular disease. There are neurologic or brain related problems with lead and it can cause abdominal pain as well in an acute setting. However, lead also has an effect on the immune system. You know, there was right. a great study done in Poland where they looked at levels of lead <clears throat> in utero. So in moms who are pregnant, and then they followed those children up until they were nine years old. The children that were born to the moms who had the highest level of blood lead had significant risk for severe allergies. Mm -hmm. This was, um, I think the study was done in the 90s. So a little while ago, but not that long ago. And this is a connection that most doctors don't make is that these toxicant exposures are immune toxicants and right. affect the immune system. You know, even in uh, the, the reason I brought up the mercury tables here is that this is another metal commonly found high, especially in patients who eat fish. The uh, US Forest Service did a study of all the inland lakes and streams in the United States in 2011, they published the study and they found out that 50% of all the fish, we're not talking about the big ocean tuna or the big ocean shark or the big ocean, um, other fish that are high in mercury, like swordfish. These are inland fish like trout and um, bass. And they found out that 50% of the inland fish had levels of mercury or a chemical called PCBs that were higher than the allowable EPA level in fish, right? And this includes wild fish. My patients will say to me, I'm eating wild fish though. Shouldn't that take care of it? These are all wild fish. These right. are lake, stream, reservoir, uh, and, and creek fish. And, you know, 
I paid attention to that because I was very tuned in to fish as a source of mercury. So here we are again, the Environmental Protection Agency, as an agency, you can see, oh look, levels of mercury in people are rising. They're not going down over time. So if you look at the population from 2009 to 2010, which sadly is the latest data that we have, it's 10 years old, right. you'll see that in the top 5% of the population, levels of mercury are over the safe level that the EPA actually allows for blood mercury. So 5.0. And this is um, microgram per liter, whole blood, is the, the top. In other words, it's you can have blood mercury over 5.0, but there you you've got it. Five percent of the American population is actually mercury toxic. Now, as a physician, I know that the data shows me that levels as low as one, which is somewhere in here between the 50th and the 75th percentile, so at least 25% of the population, has blood mercury levels high enough that it can alter thyroid function. So we know that thyroid disease, autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, Graves' disease, or autoimmune thyroiditis is a huge problem in the United States of America as it is around the world. And that mercury is one of the toxicants that is involved in <clears throat> autoimmune thyroiditis. And so here we have evidence from a government database that mercury exposure in the United States population is significant enough that 25% of the population could be having symptoms of toxicity, at least from an autoimmune standpoint, as the result of their exposure to mercury through fish. Yeah. Now, I'm not gonna talk about amalgam fillings um, because that's a whole nother sticky wicket. It's not that it doesn't cause problems, but that's very hard to diagnose that from a medical standpoint. Uh, that mercury doesn't end up in the blood, it ends up in the urine, but there's no direct correlation between having an amalgam filling and having a blood urine level. So, right. so yeah. I think this is, you know, you wanted data. This is a huge, huge database. Look at this. Uh, in 2009, 2010, um, 8,700 people in this study. You know, when we look at uh, statistics, we always want to try and figure out as scientists, what is the, um, necessary population that we need to study. How many people do we need to study to get statistical significance? And if you look in medical literature, you know, a huge study is considered 5,000 people. Huge study. Most studies are 200, 300, 400 people. This is almost 9,000 individuals. Um, repeated, these are not the same individuals every year, it's a different population. So you're really looking at 32,000 individuals studied over the period of 10 years. Right. Most of my patients, their mercury is hovering in the 90th, 95th above. They're lucky if it's 75th percentile and they're coming to me. Remember, my patients are have complex chronic illness and they've got autoimmune conditions. And so I'm seeing this in the trenches with yes. the patients. I mean... It's Absolutely. Not yeah, it's, uh, and I believe because of your locality, you know, being in California, which is a, a more of a fish eating population than Kansas or Indiana or landlocked states, you know, that don't have a lot of water bodies, um, you are looking at patients that may be exposed through their dietary intake. And one thing I'll mention, just because uh, no one ever talks about this, high fructose corn syrup. Mm -hmm is a sweetener, right? It is, uh, it is used a lot in a tremendous variety of foods, everything from instant oatmeal to barbecue sauce. Uh, it is, I published, I was one of the authors on this paper. We published a study looking at the mercury and high fructose corn syrup because of the manufacturing technologies that are used. Mercury is actually used in the manufacturing of high fructose corn syrup. It is another dietary item that is 
uh, contaminated, not on purpose, but contaminated nonetheless with inorganic mercury. And we actually published that study. I worked with uh, a bench researcher at the Food and Drug Administration who was very concerned about this. And we actually sent a sample of high fructose corn syrup into NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology to get it measured. And they actually corroborated um, that, that these samples of high fructose corn syrup were contaminated with mercury. So you may also be seeing that, a population right. that's eating a lot of high fructose corn syrup. A lot of our patients come from all over the country, actually. So for even the mm. ones who are not from California, still, I'm seeing that. But one thing I'm seeing in California, since a fire season has developed, that, that started over the past four or five years, we didn't have fire season before. Now it's every year without fail, unfortunately, I'm seeing mercury levels higher in people than I did before. I so wish there's, I a, there's a reason for that, as yeah. you know, uh, that I guess we have to talk about. So conifers, trees that have needles, like ponderosa pine trees, that's a, my uh, area has a lot of ponderosa pine trees, actually will take up mercury from the soil. Well, to start, um, where does mercury come from? When coal is burned, uh, in plants that are making electricity, that coal contains mercury in the earth from you know thousands of years of compression. Mercury uh, does exist as a metal in the earth. It's when it's burned, when the coal is burned, that mercury is released, uh, especially in China where the, the scrubbers on, on the electric plants are not that great, the coal burning electric plants. And it actually floats all the way across the Pacific Ocean and lands in California, uh, as well as other parts of the United States and Canada. Uh, conifers will take up that mercury and actually store it in their needles. And an amazing researcher from the University of Washington actually was able to trace the release and movement of mercury from wildfire smoke uh, into the atmosphere. So sadly, I think that our recent spate of, of wildfire um, ex smoke exposure that's happened in, you know, since 2015 across the West has released more airborne mercury. And we do uh, take that in atmospherically. So we do breathe that in um, and it does stay in our bodies once we're exposed to it. Right. So, so I think, you know, you brought up a really important this whole topic now of the complication that all physicians are, are seeing, whether they deal with it or not, is the complication of daily exposure to toxicants and either the resurgence of what were well-controlled chronic infections or uh, new chronic infections as a result of these exposures because they're immune toxicants. Um, right. as well as continued exposure to mold and mycotoxins from uh, building. Um, right. It's a, big, it's a yeah. big deal for these patients. Right. So, so at this point, at this juncture, I feel like I have just spewed out a lot of science. And what I want to say to your audience is these exposures are not, will never be easily dealt with using a five-day detox. I mean, this is exactly. sadly, sadly, this is becoming, um, it's, it's a false belief that anything you can put in your body for five days is going to relieve your body burden, all the toxicants you've been exposed to since you were in utero. It's physically impossible. Exactly. And then I coined the term pre-tox because what I'm seeing is a lot of patients have been put through detox therapies, maybe at the local yoga studio or maybe online somewhere, or maybe even with their functional medicine or naturopathic doctor, but it backfired on them. They began they to get sick. They got sick. They felt worse. Yeah. Um, Flu-like symptoms or headaches or body aches and pains. At first they think it's normal. I'm just detoxing. That's a part of it, right? But then it went on and on throughout the process, maybe on and on for a week or two weeks, and, and they had to stop. So these patients are just not ready for detox. I'd love to talk about that. Yeah. 
So this is really crucial. And I'm so glad you're bringing this up. I want to share my screen just for a moment. <clears throat> because I would like to talk about why this happens. Um, this is a, a little slide set from a recent podcast uh, of mine. I do a monthly podcast called the EMEI Review for physicians to kind of help them understand a little bit more about environmental medicine. So we have to stop this denial we have that we're all completely nutritionally sufficient because we eat a standard American diet, or maybe we eat more than, better than a standard American diet. First of all, 75% of the United States population, this is actually from a study, that's the study down there in the bottom left-hand corner, don't even get the recommended intake of fruit and more than 80% of the American population doesn't eat the recommended intake of vegetables. So right there, you're not gonna be getting adequate fiber, adequate magnesium, um, and many of the polyphenols, the uh, active components that are found in fruits and vegetables. But here's the really damning information. This again, what I just showed you, the database that we just looked at a minute ago is called the NHANES database, National Health and Nutrition um, Estimation Survey, I think. I can't remember what the E stands for, but you know, NHANES, we'll call it. So this is looking at the year 2003 to 2006, so not that long ago. Be, remember the big vans that go around and collect all the urine in the blood? Not only do they look at toxicants, they look at vitamins and minerals in these individuals' bloodstreams. <clears throat> and what they're looking at is how much they're getting and is it enough? And they're looking at what's called an estimated average requirement. Remember the RDAs that told you how yeah. much you, we don't use those anymore. Those are antiquated. We now have an estimated average requirement, which is actually an improvement because it's a little more um, aligned to your gender and your age and you know, what you might have particular increased needs for. So it takes into account pregnancy and lactation and everything. But take a look at this. So these are the percentage that are not getting enough. They're not getting even the estimated average requirement. And this includes, um, this is everybody over 19 years, so this isn't children, but this includes even if they're getting enriched or fortified food. So vitamin D, 95% of the American population. And remember the NHANES, you know, those big buses that go out, they uh, are they are calculating what is reflective of the American population. So they don't just take everybody. They take a certain number of men, a certain number of women, certain um, uh, backgrounds, certain races, certain age groups, 95%. 93% aren't getting enough vitamin E. 71% aren't getting enough vitamin K. Half of them aren't getting enough calcium and on and on. 60.9% aren't getting enough magnesium. This it's is crucial. Yeah. We only talk about one thing, one mineral today. We're going to talk about magnesium. So uh, the argument uh, that, hey, what about people who take supplements? Well, NHANES knows that, right? So they actually looked at a certain percentage of this population and they looked at their supplements. What about that? Well, uh, vitamin C. 27% of those who are taking vitamin C weren't even getting it the, the, the minimum, the average require the average daily requirement for vitamin C. And even those, those who were taking supplements still didn't meet the EARs for vitamin D, vitamin C, calcium, and again, magnesium, right? So 40% of those who were taking a vitamin, almost half didn't get enough magnesium. Why am I harping about magnesium? Because magnesium is absolutely crucial for liver function, for function of the nervous system, for function of the endocrine system. I could go on and on, but here's the reason I'm gonna talk about magnesium even more. 
My mentor, Dr. William Ray, he's the guy that was the cardiothoracic surgeon who also was the pioneer. Uh, we call him the kind of the father of environmental medicine <clears throat> who had a outpatient clinic uh, that he turned into an inpatient clinic for people who were severely ill from toxic and exposure. He did a study where he looked at magnesium levels in the body. And he did, a, this was a very, very sophisticated technical study where he gave uh, magnesium intravenously and then he measured magnesium that was coming out in the urine. Uh, we actually adopted that protocol in our clinic and used it as a very elegant way to figure out whether people had adequate magnesium body storage or not. Um, you can just measure ionized magnesium in the bloodstream. You can look at red blood cell magnesium, but this was a very sophisticated, and I'm going to say a much more detailed look at magnesium. Guess what? All of his patients who were environmentally ill could not hold on to magnesium to save their lives. All of our patients who were environmentally ill in my clinic could not hold on to magnesium to save their lives. It's like a sieve, you know, those hourglass where you pour the magnesium in one end and it comes out the other. Guess why? All of these patients had been exposed to pesticides, either because they lived in an area where pesticides were sprayed, they had used pesticides in their homes or in their yards, or their neighbors had used pesticides in their homes or in their yards, or they had been applicators, they had worked at, uh, in occupations where they were asked to spray pesticides. Pesticides literally knock out the proteins in the intestinal tract, they're called transporters, uh, ion trans magnesium ion transporters that attach to the magnesium and allow it to actually be taken up through the gut. So those folks you know, need some special attention. As you know, you need to give them choline in order to allow them to take it the magnesium. But guess what happens when you've got, you know, uh, the average person, uh, and I don't care how old they are, let's say 23 year old or 67 year old, who learns about detox uh, on the internet and decides to spend a lot of money getting some bottles of pills uh, that maybe contain magnesium and starts taking them. And uh, they're not, uh, as you know, Dr. Papia, maybe they're magnesium deficient and they don't have good bowel movements, right? Maybe they have right. a bowel movement once every three or four days. Those are the individuals that end up in your office that you see. And when you take a history, they say, oh yeah, I tried detox, almost killed me. Right. There's a very good reason why. <laughs> you cannot eliminate toxicants from your body without magnesium sufficiency because magnesium is so important. All the enzymes in the liver that allow your body to actually process and release toxicants. Right. So oh, I my rest God. my case. Yeah. Thank you for that. These patients also might have other problems that prevent them from being able to detox as well. Maybe they're not sleeping well. Maybe they have constipation and other GI issues. Maybe they have urinary tract infections or yes. interstitial cystitis. My patients tend to have mast cell activation system uh, sy syndrome and and, and neural uh, uh, sorry nervous system dysregulation. Yeah. And so, or hormonal imbalances. So <clears throat> we have to work on all of these areas before we can even begin to detox the patient, because when we're detoxing there's byproducts of dying cells and there's toxins yes. coming through. And yes. so this should be inflammation that's transient. Our body should be able to keep that as transient inflammation as we eliminate the toxins. But these patients, they're already inflamed from having infections, exactly. toxins. The inflammation increases and exacerbates symptoms they already have. And so they're just not ready for detox until there's certain things that we clear certain obstacles we clear first exactly they're not stable they're not stable i mean no. these are stable individuals and now you know fast forward to 2022 when we're dealing with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and injuries related to the spike protein mm -hmm. we have yet another layer of toxicity that we have to deal with we do in fact we're seeing people with long haul from all over the country 
We're, ta we're part of Dr. Bruce Patterson's group. Yes, which, good. Yeah, and well, who finds us are the people who become chronically ill from long haul because that's what our clinic is known for, chronic unexplainable illnesses. So they come to us and, and I'm seeing that long haul is very similar to chronic Lyme. Yes, and I think you and I, because we have insight from our own perspective around toxic and exposure and how that causes inflammation and MCAS and everything, right. um, you know, a few years from now, we'll be able to look back and see that these people were predisposed to long haul syndrome as a result of their pre existing inflammation, their pre existing body exactly. burden, their pre existing uh, infection. Right. And I think it's important to look at their genes you know, oh, yeah. like look at their genes of detoxification. So I have a sense, well, you, you, do you have a high body burden because of this? You know, yes. you know, Dr. Ray actually did that research and published it. He was so far ahead of his time before uh -huh. you and I even knew what a single nucleotide polymorphism was. And that's uh -huh. just a long, fancy word for a little um, one amino acid exchange in your uh, genes that makes them not as effective at making things like proteins and enzymes. And we've all got them. Everyone on planet earth has these SNPs, right? But he was able to see that in his patients who are predisposed to multiple chemical sensitivity, that they had certain phase two SNPs related to, um, detoxification. And now because we're burdened with more toxicants, we're even less capable of detoxifying those, um, that body burden, right? Right, so, our, our, our body has not evolved to match the level of toxins on the planet and therefore in our body. So we have our organs of elimination, the liver, the gut, the skin, the kidneys. Um, and yes, they do detoxify, but they did not evolve for a planet this toxic for bodies this so, time. Fortunately, fortunately, Dr. Parpia, we, you know, you and I have both seen patients and, and I, I want to make sure that we talk about this because this is the hope of our conversation. We've seen patients, I know Dr. Ray saw thousands of patients who literally were so unstable, they were completely disabled. Um, one of them now in, in my practice is now climbing 14,000 foot mountains for fun. You know, that's, that's beautiful. So it is, we have the resources to be able to assist our biological systems, even with this high exposure level of infectious agents and toxicants to be able to shift right? To, we can upgrade our systems to be able to do this, but a five-day detox is not, you know, I'm really so disheartened by physicians who are promoting this because it's unscientific. There's no substantiation in the medical literature for this whatsoever, and I would caution everyone to be very skeptical if someone says they have evidence that they can uh, treat someone with a five-day detox. It is so much more technical and necessitates so much more education and testing and assessment to be able to, to honestly begin the journey, which is going to take a lot longer than five days. Right. Or I mean, days or 30 days. I was about to say, I'll even see patients who are saying, I'm doing a 30 day, I'm doing a one month, or I'm doing a three month detox, but a lot hasn't been evaluated. And, 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 that's where it falls short, right? We need to look at the patient's toxin load and their oxidative stress levels and um, their nutritional status and their hormonal status and what infections might or might not be there. We need to look at their inflammatory cytokines, especially their genomics with, with their long genomics. Yeah. Right, right. Absolutely. And, right. And so it's just not a casual thing. It, uh, it's medical. <laughs> yeah, it is, a, it is a medical process that necessitates a deep dive. And I think that 
um, yes, money is involved for sure, because the data that we absolutely need necessitates laboratory testing. You know, Dr. Ray was very clear about this. He said, you do not know how to treat a patient until you understand their body burden. Right. And by body burden, he was talking about the specific toxicants that they have and how much they have. You know, back in the day, this is how old I am, um, we actually worked with a laboratory uh, that allowed us to do biopsies. So we did fat biopsies and we sent in adipose tissue samples uh -huh. from the box, a very simple procedure, you know, uh, in office procedure, not surgery. And we were able to see so much more than what was in the blood or the urine. Sadly, we don't have access to that laboratory anymore. That was a forensic lab that we used. Uh, but we, I'm telling you, because I saw it, I, I saw it in so many patients, uh, we do have a body burden, every single one of us. How we can eliminate that body burden is informed by everything you just mentioned. You know, our genomics, our hormones, our nutrient levels, our capacity to absorb uh, nutrients and retain nutrients, how fast we use them up and eliminate them. You know, that's our microbiome. Body our microbiome. Yeah. And by the way, this is just a, a personal uh, rant. One of the really important things we have to remember is that when we eat uh, non-organic food, otherwise known as conventionally grown food, that food has pesticide residues. Right. Pesticides are biocides. They kill bugs. They kill bacteria. What do you think happens when you eat a conventionally grown strawberry? And that pesticide residue makes its way into your intestines. That pesticide is still active and it does absolutely affect your microbiome. So it is, I think, folly for us to think that we can have a normalized microbiome when we're taking in these toxicants like triclosan and fungicides from conventionally grown foods. Right. Dr. Ray was very clear about that. He put his patients on an all organic diet and he literally meant it. And I put my patients on an all organic diet and I literally mean it. Me US too. Certified yeah. organic. 100%. Yeah. 100%. And same with personal products, shampoos, well, hair products. Yes. Makeup, you know, all of it. We have to be very, very careful. That's the hardest area actually for me to guarantee. <clears throat> when I recommend personal care products that they will be uh, BPA free, there's no certification for BPA free cosmetics, and there's no certification for perfluorinate free cosmetics, as we just saw uh, perfluorinates are in cosmetics. So we just have to be super careful about that. Right. And, and lower our body burden as much as we can by eating organic and um, filtering water. Yes. It's also very sure. important making sure that the bowels are moving regularly. Yes. Um, there's so much that we have to do for pre-tox before yeah. we can even begin detox. Well, I think we've pretty much covered this issue of pre-tox. <laughs> so. <laughs> are, there, are, there any, uh, are there any questions that you have for me about um, pre-tox? Because I agree with you 100% that there is no way on this earth that I could take a patient without all the information that we've talked about and begin any kind of detoxification regimen uh, and, and know that I was doing it safely or effectively. Exactly that. That's about it. For the, for the doctors out there who want to learn more about this. Oh, yes, yes. So uh, teaching. Yeah, so uh, e -M -E -I -global com is my website. Uh, and I'm sure if you uh, reach out to Dr. Parpy, I don't know if you have uh, any info at Gmail or info at email uh, addresses that you give out with your webcast. Certainly she can pass that on to me, yeah. but you can go to our website and learn all about our educational program. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And then, um... You can just, we'll give everybody information on how to contact us by email as well. It'll be info, info at gordonmedical.com.
Wonderful. Yeah. And so Dr. Parpia and Dr. Eric Gordon, I have watched them over the years in terms of, you know, I just have to say that you have taken the field of treating chronic complex illness to another level. There are so few physicians that can walk in both worlds of understanding environmental toxic and exposure and understanding chronic complex illness infection, you know, Lyme and mold, uh, you know, I, there's a handful of us, right? Right. And we have to uh, educate as many physicians as possible and also help patients understand that this is a highly specialized area. It sure is. And that not all physicians who specialize in uh, Lyme or Lyme and mold understand the other world of environmental illness and toxic and burden. Actually, most of them don't, yeah. most don't. And so when patients come to me, they've been to well, a minimum of five other doctors, usually 10, sometimes 15 or 20, and, and none of them have addressed the environmental toxicity piece. Meanwhile, the patient is saying, I know I'm toxic, I, I can feel it, right? So I said, well, let's just test that. Let's do a, a clear history to see how toxic you are, mm -hmm. how inflamed you are. Of course, mm -hmm. those tests show it. And, and so the doctors might know how to kill infections really well, but yeah. I can't even touch an infection until I've, I've detoxed the patient. And, and I say it, but this is how infections become chronic infections. Exactly. Exactly. They treat it and then the patient relapses. Right. Right. Because... If the patient isn't detoxed first and the infections are killed, well, next time there's a stressor of any sort, the body is still a perfect host for those infections to flare. I couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly the concept, right? Especially right. with the line. Absolutely. Right. Well, there is hope. There's absolutely oh, more and more doctors are being educated because of you. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we get a fair spectrum of doctors. We have everything from oncologists, OBGYNs, anesthesiologists who decided right. not to do anesthesiology anymore, um, naturopathic physicians, chiropractors. Uh, we have some acupuncturists and some uh, nutritionists. And at, at every level of their capacity to work with people, um, all of them have the ability now to do the appropriate assessments um, and identification of toxic and exposure and treatment. So um, what I'm hoping, and you know, my life's mission is to really uh, spread this, what should have been basic education, public health and toxic and exposure in all of their educations, right? right. Uh, in their public health uh, classes. But it, it's been sadly left out. You know, even in my own early, I went to school in the early 80s, I graduated in 1984 of naturopathic medicine. Uh, the curriculum was limited, I think, as because um, the faculty weren't educated, right? We didn't right. learn about lead toxicity, but that was kind of it. Right. We, I mean, we only had Dr. John Hibbs teaching us just one doctor who's a great doctor, but he is a great doctor. only one, only one class. I had to hunt this out on my own, <laughs> you know, and here I am. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Hibbs is a very good friend of mine and a colleague and a great environmental toxicologist and a wonderful physician. And so you were right. very lucky. Yeah, I feel yeah. that. I wish it was more than one class, though. I mean, I, not for me anymore because I've learned so much on my own after after I graduated. But for the for the current students, I hope it's more than just one class. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. I don't know, but well, I'm certainly going to put as much education out there as I have life left in me, which is many years. So much, <laughs> right? Many, many years. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you so, so much. This has been wonderful and informative for our audience. I'm just so pleased you were here. With it's me been today. great to talk to you, Dr. Parpia. Really great. Thank you.